Muse. From 2016 to 2018, she was a curatorial fellow in African and Indigenous American Arts at Stanford University's Cantor Arts Center. She's also served in curatorial and scholarly capacities at the Yale University Art Gallery, the National Museum of African Art, and several other institutions as well, too many uh, to, to note here. Um, Dr. Maples has written essays, books, and articles on historical and contemporary African arts, museum practices, and collecting practices, as well as restitution debates. She holds a doctorate from the University of California, Santa Cruz. And I have just realized I don't have in front of me the title of Dr. Maples' talk um, on the um, topic of um, restitution and current debates around decolonizing museums. So I will turn it over to her now. Don't, don't worry, it's on my slide. <laughs> I, thought it, I thought it might be, that's great. Yeah. I'll go ahead and share my screen because it's always, it always takes a sec to get things going and you can see my notes for a minute, hopefully not for too long. Does that look good? That looks great. All right, good. <laughs> uh, that, that is the title of the talk, Radical Healing and Decoloniality, Museums in Transition. Uh, so good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for, uh, for joining us for this conversation. Thank you to Vicki and Ada for, the, uh, for bringing us all together today for the introduction, of course. Thank you. And for all of you for taking the time and the energy to be here. I appreciate you all. So um, this might be a bit rhetorical, but in a small anecdote I've been thinking about lately, um, I don't know if any of you listen to podcasts, so <laughs> I'm sure some of you do. I think of it as sort of the, the sport and the primary medium of the pandemic right now, along with Netflix. It's like Netflix and podcasts. Um, and I don't know if any of you noticed this, but there's been a huge uptick in mental health ads and therapy ads in these podcasts and in these news and, and media. So has anyone else noticed that? And feel free to type in the chat. I won't really see it, but um, I, I just thought that this, you know, became apparent to me over the last year or so, and it occurred to me that this crystallizes our current moment and parallels what is being asked of museums um, as well. So it's a bit of a barometer for what Wayne Modest calls our politics of anxiety, uh, and I think provides a backdrop for our discussion on radical healing and decoloniality today. So for this evening, I do, um, I want to open up the floor for discussion and Q&A as much as possible. So I'll try to present some ideas that I have brewing, uh, rethink curation as a processual or social process, processual act, uh, and the museum as a transformative space for coming together and healing despite its histories of violence and the colonial legacies of its making and collecting practices. As with decolon decolonization and curation, this presentation is a thinking through uh, and it's open-ended. So I don't have all the answers. I'm very much presenting just some ideas that I'm thinking through um, as I work through my own processes, particularly as we gear up for a cross-cultural, cross-departmental reinstallation at the North Carolina Museum of Art and noting what I see happening as museums transition into a very different kind of future. It did not go forward. All right, <laughs> I might have to click it to make it advance. Um, so, but first let's look at a few pictures um, and this slide and the next. What do these have in common? Uh, how do they relate to issues of curation, uh, reparations, museum histories, and the legacies of colonialism and empire? Uh, maybe you recognize some of these, um, maybe you don't, but all of us have had some relationship to these issues, uh, rather obliquely or directly, and this is our current anxiety. So who recognized the scene in the upper right, for example? Uh, who knows the real story that they're referencing here? And I'm hoping that uh, some of you figured out that it is a thinly veiled reference to the 1897 raid on the Benin Kingdom in present day Nigeria. So this scene popularized the debate on restitutions and brought some of the histories of empire building and looting that were rampant during the colonial era in Africa and of course elsewhere. It reached a new level of public awareness and consciousness and actually relates to the image in the lower left, which is an object in the collection of the North Carolina Museum of Art, also from the Benin Kingdom. 
So with the advent of global protests urgently calling for social justice and the end of systemic racism, violence against black bodies and police brutality. So think Black Lives Matter, Roads Must Fall um, I, and SARS amongst many others. Museums like other institutions have been called upon to reflect on their own institutional histories and grapple with the role that they've played in perpetuating stereotypes and inequities, both in gallery and collections representations and within their administration. As a parallel to this current moment, I've noticed a dramatic shift in curatorial responsibilities in addition to that of museums, which are in a major, major, major moment of transition and change that coincides with the end of the quote, modern world system, end quote, and a radical moment of indeterminacy. And this topic is near and dear to my heart and something I think about indeed live on a daily basis. I've definitely noticed over the last few years a significant shift in my own job as a curator. And so I'm presenting today from that perspective as a curator in the United States in the 21st century over the um, trained in anthropology, African arts and museum studies, and who has been working in museums and specifically with African arts since the early 2000s. And so here is my arms crossed in front of cool arts ubiquitous curator photo with two quotes that have inspired my work and thinking this last year. I joke, but this is actually the kind of tight curatorial role as singular expert and connoisseur that is being examined today. I'd also like to point out that working with African arts tends to involve significant field work and theoretical foundations in anthropology and ethnography. So a lot of what has informed my thinking for today comes from critically analyzing anthropological frameworks and ethnographic museums, as well as art ones like the one that I work in. And since I've seen my own job change fundamentally and dramatically in the last few years, what is a curator and what is curation? These are 21st century working definitions of curation that I argue are being challenged along with our value systems. Note keywords like selection of objects as part of a collection that may also be digital and that often include expert or professional knowledge. So as I mentioned, we are at an anxious moment in this country, anxiety politics as Wayne Modest would have it. And this includes identity politics, global protests against persistent systemic racism amidst the global pandemic and within an anti-humanist moment that threatens democracy and our collective and individual health as Shumbembe has argued. As another indicator, check out two of the charts by an Instagram favorite of mine, Matt Shirley, and the tiny sense of unity across the country and the world that took a global pandemic to, to occur, along with the increase of our worrying and social isolation and the crash of our jobs and savings, not to mention those of us already experiencing uh, social or economic stress. It is within this climate that museums as public facing interpreters of art, culture, and the nation, and as one of the core institutions of modernity, as Rolando Vasquez reminds us, are being called on to attend to much more than in the past with our jobs and responsibilities fundamentally changing. We are here prompted to ask ourselves as curators in our museums as creators of citizens, to what extent have intersectional forms of oppression and privilege found a breeding ground in the museum? And can we unlearn this self-made narrative? Despite all this complexity, my argument is somewhat simple. We as curators of museums don't attend to just objects anymore, but to the healing, so think repairing, reparations, well-being, identity, emotional health of our visitors through those objects and their biographies. So how they're used, how they're interpreted, where they go, et cetera. This is essentially part of a broader decoloniality or decolonial project. So to, to think through and have a working understanding of decoloniality, I follow the work of Walter Mignolo and Catherine Walsh, amongst others, who reject, reject or negate the universality of Western thought, focusing rather on its relationality. In the museum space, this means not to simply include other practices and concepts in with our own, but to connect and bring local histories, subjectivities, and knowledges, these pluralities of experience, together against the modern colonial order. 
This relationality as a theoretical model can also be found in the work of Edward Glissant and Felwyn Saar. I uh, think New Relational Ethics in the famous Savoy Saar Report of 2017. For the purposes of today, then, we can think of decolonizing museum curation as involving the decoding of museum collections from the colonial meanings in which they have been embedded. The biographies of objects in museum spaces, specifically African ones, are characterized by displacement, erasure, and decontextualization, and then subject to categorization, labeling, translation processes, and transposition into alien hierarchies, of, uh, binary hierarchies that emerge from Western rationalism and value systems of imperialism. What is at stake here is a revaluation, and I here stress the word value because it is a redressing of the frameworks of value that are being questioned and challenged today. Instead, it is being replaced with a system valuing morals and ethics and the emotional health of our community, what we call our collective humanity, one could think. So as I argue, there has been a shift of value from objects back to humans as a re retaliation to these anxious politics of national anti-humanist threats and threats to our democracy. Additionally, a large part of efforts to decolonize, decenter, or deconstruct the ordering of knowledge that still dominates today comes from the urgent need for innovative theory from the South, to quote the Komarovs, as a vital way of pluralizing and expanding knowledge sources. But in order to find them and to work towards a collective radical healing, we need to listen mindfully completely before we act. Which leads me to radical listening and what I mean by radical healing. Um, so basically, what is radical listening? Radical listening, according to Carol Gilligan, feminist psychologist, ethicist, researcher, and author, is a way of listening that gets to the root of the conversation. It alerts us not only to what is being said, but what is not being said and why. Extend this to the museum space and you've got who is not being said, who is being erased and why. Radical listening is listening that creates trust. It is the deepest manifestation of respect for the experience of others and what can be learned by listening to them. Radical listening in short is a way of listening that empathically gets to the root of the exchange involves trust and respect and a valuing of human experience. And all of this takes a lot of time, which is kind of one of the complexities of museum work. We often don't have a lot of time. So as Wayne Modest and colleagues have suggested, the museum can be regarded as a space of working through in which the analysis of anthropological legacies can be used to identify a complexity of global entanglements and asymmetries, potentially contributing to forging better, perhaps more healed futures. The making of an exhibition can thus serve as a testing ground on which to explore the potentials and challenges involved in bringing ideas and aspirations into play with existing material cultural legacies, namely the collections and museum administration and display techniques. The hope is to transform contested museum spaces and enable negotiations on ownership, representation, and memory politics to emerge. And so I'd like to think about the upcoming reinstallation at the NCMA, which the museum has titled The People's Collection Reimagined, which I think is a quite telling title, as a space of working through and highlights a few of the newest works. Uh, I want to highlight a few of the newest works and narratives in the African collection that will be unveiled. It could then serve as a way to probe the possibilities and limitations of curatorial practice, which I hope to do in the Q&A. On the right, I've inserted a picture of a project I started soon after arriving at the museum in 2018 called Interchanges, Cross-Cultural Conversations. It was originally called Interventions, but that got changed by the administration. So that kind of indicates some of the complexities of working in museums. It soon became an entire curatorial and museum-wide project in which we juxtapose various arts across the divides of genre, medium, department, geography, to challenge contested categorizations. It also became the testing grounds for the current reinstallation, which we are right in the middle of authoring right now. <laughs> If there is time in the q and I uh, could also speak towards the new major traveling exhibition project that Vicky mentioned uh, that focuses on individual masquerade artists and the ethics of working with these living artists with the aim of sketching an ethical and transparent model for field research, in addition to highlighting the hyper contemporaneity of West African masquerade, despite its consistent relegation to ethnography. 
So I recently installed uh, this little sneak peek of the reinstallation. And this is basically because they deinstalled all the African in the other buildings. So I, I had to have something for a while. Um, but I, I installed this little sneak peek of the reinstallation in um, two of the galleries of the West Building at the NCMA, if you've been there. Uh, I use this as an opportunity to prompt input and feedback and to relay some of the narratives that will drive the reinstall, which is set to open this September. And as I mentioned, is a cross-cultural collaborative curatorial process and taking place across the entire museum, both buildings, also in the park, uh, with four thematic galleries that we are co-curating, um, conservation, deep dives, performances in the gallery spaces, music, digital labels, QR codes, we're introducing some new interpretation strategies. In addition to a focus on the potentials for healing in museum spaces, the reinstallation's African galleries center on human experience as the driving force for the dynamic production and circulation of people, ideas, and also objects. Instead of bound by culture, geography, or foreign influence, the work selected emphasize creative innovation as uh, demonstrated in the vast array of materials, genres, forms, and techniques employed by African artists, both on the continent and globally, and of course, over a great deal of time. After acknowledging the colonial histories that are behind collecting practices in North American museums like the NCMA, and so the formation of a particular canon, um, I, the, the presentation focuses on erasure, on facing histories head on, while highlighting and balancing resistance and resilience and the persistence of artistic production like Masquerade, for example. Um, and when I've gone through this, I've asked myself as I'm writing or as I'm thinking through this, some, some questions like, how did these arts enter the collection? Who is um, speaking? Who can I um, highlight? How can we collaborate to ethically tell these stories and support global circulations of objects? So I've had some of these things kind of rattling around as I've been writing. Uh, programming plans uh, look to activating the space in various ways, from musical performances to mindful meditation, to slow looking, to community feedback and interpretation. And those are all a bit more towards that intangible healing thing I've been talking about. So let's look at a selection of new works that are added to the collection rather recently, and that will be revealed in the reinstall as a way to get into the new narratives and their potentials. So there's, of course, darker sides to history that are often obscured, sometimes intentionally, and that certain artworks can help to reveal. Museums often steer away from these kinds of histories, especially art galleries, I would uh, argue, <laughs> whether in their collections or the display, their display techniques. So, however, a critical aspect of museum pursuits to decolonize includes the overturning of one-dimensional historical narratives that have for too long obfuscated everyday realities and the violence at play and in colonial and imperial histories. So one way museums can do this is by introducing powerful new works that remember histories whose telling can uh, return agency to those who have been systematically repressed. So in 2019, the NCMA acquired a provocative work by internationally recognized South African artist William Kentridge, who, by the way, is white. So there are opportunities to tease out identity politics and expectations uh, in South Africa uh, that interrogates just such a hidden history. This three channel video installation entitled Kaboom tells the story of nearly 2 million African porters and carriers used by the British, French and the Germans during the First World War. The charcoal drawings for the animated film provide a backdrop to Kentridge's signature trope of procession, a pageant of what we've chosen not to remember. Porters bearing the physical loads across Africa, but also the historical legacy and paradoxes of colonialism magnified by the war. Since memory and knowledge, especially local and cultural, are essential to constructing identity, Kentridge counters a disarticulation of the past with a new kind of remembering that turns to history to shine a light on little known chapters, to critique the past, and to highlight topics that remain relevant and urgent today. In telling even fractured narratives, we reignite memory and honor those that have been pushed to the margins. Kaboom thus relates to the documentary and restitution movements of post-apartheid South Africa and African responses to the paradoxes of post-colonialisms. This powerful time-based work will be unveiled finally this fall in its own site-specific uh, space in the reinstallation. 
I'm really excited about it. In this recent, uh, this other recent acquisition by Omer Victor Job, the artist reenacts a 19th century portrait of famous orator and abolitionist Frederick Douglass, who was the most photographed person at that time. Douglas commissioned this piece as a publicity tool to gain supporters for his campaign, which I didn't actually know before this. Job emulates Douglas's intense gaze in a captivating expression of determination. He holds a soccer official's whistle in his hand, reinforcing the theme of globalization and maybe even also whistleblowing as it relates to voluntary versus forced migration throughout time. And as scholar Beth Bugenhagen argues, returns dignity to the African migrant rather than focuses on the crisis of migration. The addition of the pattern backdrop references wax print textiles as a product of imperialist trade networks and nods to the pioneering work of photographers Seydou Keita, Malik Sidibe, and Mama Cassette. In addition, African photographers frequently used the hero shot, working at eye level or below their sitters, making them seem larger than life and increasing their importance, which is definitely also at play here. The image comes from the Diaspora series, which explores the construction of identities by replacing Baroque era accessories for soccer paraphernalia that reference an underlying conversation on global consumerism and migration, as I mentioned, as well as the relationship between notoriety and erasure for Black constituents. For Job, comparable racial circumstances between historical figures and contemporary soccer players subvert the accepted migration success stories that ignore experiences for, of racism and exclusion for members of the diaspora. I also want to note that I've tried to introduce more and more artist lectures and interviews, both virtual and in person, and that's one of the, I guess, bonuses of the pandemic is more time for digital content um, in exciting new ways that engage our audiences with our African collections and allow the artists themselves or other stakeholders to speak. Um, it's a more relationship oriented and pluralistic way to approach the museum space. So here you can see a conversation I had with Omar and two other Senegalese artists, Alun B and Sadly Rabi Khan. And you can find this on our YouTube channel, as well as in the reinstallation gallery kiosks when they are reinstalled this fall. Finally, this image will be in a gallery on interventions of resistance, resilience, and revisions to dominant historical narratives and serves as a counter to the heavy colonial focus common in museums, or at least common in the collecting practices of museums, and to provide a more balanced look at histories of trauma and violence like the transatlantic slave trade. As an experiment, uh, I'm hoping to include label text entirely authored by the artists themselves, or that has come out of direct conversations with them in this gallery space. So I'm gonna, gonna give it a try. I briefly mentioned the raid on the Benin Kingdom, which has become the most visible of histories of looting and empire building. So think back to that Black Panther scene, um, for example, that we started with. The royal arts taken from Benin City have brought restitutions to the forefront of popular culture, media, activism, and also popularized discussions and understandings of provenance research um, and what that entails, and also misunderstandings of what it entails. It's a key aspect of any movement towards restitution and museums are being more and more transparent about the histories of acquisition and ownership that overshadow some of their collections. So now we see provenance statements published online, more information about the research happening, provenance histories on actual label texts, uh, dedicated jobs for provenance researchers. That's a relatively recent development in museums and it's really related to that. Uh, so during this raid, there were also minor things taken by soldiers as gifts upon the return, in addition to the most famous plaques and heads with which you might be more familiar. So I'll be placing this bell on view with a large didactic focus on panel, similar to the one I did on the right for the Indianapolis Museum of Art and by permission of stakeholders in Nigeria, who also read and approved of the text that I wrote. So note the shield-like plaque declaring the historic provenance of the bell as looted from the King's Palace during the 1897 raid on the Benin Kingdom. So rather than the art historical narratives one could focus on or the placement of this bell on a shrine, we can look to what this plaque also tells us about its history. So in complement to those histories. So the raid was something at that time to be quite proud of, which is very obvious with this plaque and it being on the back, you often might not see it. So we can display it differently and really highlight that history and not just the art historical or anthropological one. 
As related a potential case study, and because of my recent restitution scholarship, historian and associate professor of history at Iowa State, John Warren Monroe, reached out to me with a similarly diminutive object and a significant inscription on it that to the trained eye betrays an important provenance. Recognizing the inscription as being consistent with very old accession numbers on objects in British ethnographic collections, Moreau scooped up the work, a Janus-faced brass sword handle for the bargain price of $46.76 with free shipping, and proceeded to conduct his own provenance research on the piece. Quickly realizing its likely history as looted from Benin City in 1897 in the infamous raid, then collected by W.D. Webster and subsequently published in Pitt Rivers 1900 Antique Works of Art from Benin, so presumably in his collection as well. Of course, both Pitt Rivers and Webster are two of the major players in the circulation of these objects, and a great majority of them came through their hands, so this is a significant find. This moral problem mirrors that which American museum collections are now facing sorry, in what to do with and how to handle their Benin Kingdom and other colonial era arts, like the bell I just talked about. Do they display them? If so, how? Is transparency enough? What questions arise in terms of ownership, return, restitutions, or reparations more broadly? Who legally owns these works and how can the law be changed in order to return them? And then what about when there are competing claims as there surely have been with the Neen Kingdom works? Must one wait for an official request for return? Are loans and greater object circulations in both directions enough? My hope is to proceed with the acceptance of this work and track and publish its progress through state legal guidelines and in partnership with the NCMM or the National Commission on Monuments and Museums in Nigeria. Uh, so we can have a real case study of co-ownership, return, transfer of ownership, digital reparations or facsimiles, whatever we uh, decide on together. I want to think through the role museums are playing and how this is transforming. Accepting a work like this with a problematic history would be questionable at best, at least historically speaking with museums and the way that they have operated. But if we think of ownership as collaborative from the start and include different language in the acquisitions documentation, we can really make a fundamental change in support of more equitable global ownership and circulations. So we'll see where this goes. This is all in the works. Um, and very much developing. Uh, so with the, within that aforementioned gallery um, focused on arts of resistance, resilience, and perseverance um, is another new major acquisition that I'm exceedingly proud of um, and ready to welcome to the collection and in the galleries. So Elmina Castle is one of the original 13 large-scale slave fort replicas created by noted fantasy coffin artist Pa Joe and represents a physical place that was significant in the trafficking of human individuals during the transatlantic slave trade. While not fantasy coffins per se, these historical sites are death vessels in their own right. And the memorials models serve as a powerful reminder of where the perilous journey into slavery began. Pajo represents such histories, not only in the painstaking recreation of these sites of trauma, but also by recording the Anglophone names and histories of colonial ownership in the title and painted in red over each model's doorway. This practice reminds us that this history, while culturally embedded within the walls and within global economies, may not be visible and artists can reveal that which might be otherwise obscured. The infamous gate of no return is similarly painted in red above each of the back doors. These doors were rumored to open directly to ship and sea and were often the last glimpse of the continent that enslaved humans had. The positionality in these photos, I think, is telling, as is Marion's commentary, which is the basis for an upcoming blog post and a Community Voices label that will be featured in the reinstall. Marion noted that he grew up hearing about the gate or door of no return, but didn't know much about these specific sites. So he connected powerfully to this new work, and I felt it important to amplify his voice and experience. In the photo on the left, provided to me by Pajo himself, the building is imposing, it's massive, it's foreboding, or maybe even majestic, highlighting the grandeur of architecture, like in American plantation tours, for example, as opposed to the history of the slave trade and the oppression, et cetera. But on the right, we can look down on this recreated version from above and superimpose Pajo's historical retelling of the space. 
It is not a one-for-one -one copy though. It's an emotional, empathetic, and experiential retelling. So those last examples uh, point to, there we didn't go. <laughs> yeah, there it is. So the last examples point to the issues that I've been circling around, that emotions matter, that heritage matters, and that empathy matters. These are the intangibles that curators and museums must face uh, and must include and must create space for. Memory and history are often thought of as different things, but they constitute and affect one another in these cases. So uh, a follow-up to the amazing temporary and ephemeral chalk installation by Victor Ekpuk. If you, um, any of you have seen the 2017 installation at the NCMA, um, there was this amazing site-specific installation. And on the left, it's being erased by various members of our North Carolina community, as was always intended by the artist. Um, and in addition to various community authored label texts, like I've been mentioning, the African reinstallation will feature two site specific artist curated spaces amongst others throughout the museum. So we're all, we're getting together and doing these new artist installations peppered throughout both buildings. And I think they're gonna be really amazing new commentaries. So for the African galleries, one is an Afrofuturist art installation that will rotate every one or two years and highlight practicing North Carolina based artists that think about the future of African and diaspora arts, as well as interpolate and interpret, it, interpret uh, historical collections. So it will likely be a hybrid digital physical mural and is being designed by artists Janelle Dunlap and Marcus Kaiser. And with the second, um, the second image, the one on the right, is related to my new project, again, that we mentioned earlier, New Masks Now, Artists Innovating Masquerade in Contemporary West Africa. So um, Irve Yumbi, the artist there, is standing with um, and working with a beater in Cameroon to prepare the hybrid mask that he's holding for performance in the Kuosi Society. Afterwards, he'll be joining us here in North Carolina for a two month residency to not only work on his writing and a documentary for the New Mass Now Traveling Exhibition Project, but to design and install a complete full bodied version of this mask with crate, shipping documentation, videos, photos, and recognizing all artists that he has worked with on it. Positioned near the masquerade platform, uh, it's the next generation of the one we, we currently had in the NCMA, um, that looks at the performance of memory and intangible heritage. It will provide a contemporary counter to the Western interpretation of masquerades in museum spaces, which often focus on its latency uh, or the wooden sculptural portion of the heads alone, or its relationship to so-called traditional heritage. And then these are those kiosks that I've been mentioning um, that are a kind of evolving thing. I, I've been interviewing artists and activists in the community and just trying to highlight some of the, the other ways that people approach and think about our um, objects, the way that they might have effects on their lives and try to share those voices. Uh, so this is the old version of it. It'll be in the reinstall again. And then here is the YouTube channel, same thing. It's developing and we're hoping to include as many of those um, videos as possible, but of course they all are pending rights unless we've made them ourselves. So right now the ones that we have generated are, are on there, but we can add over the years, I will continue to grow that um, and include more and more voices from our local community. And there's also a, a QR code in the gallery you can get to these. So moving on from the reinstall and thinking of other decolonizing potentials, a major aspect of radical listening and decoloniality comes in collaborative partnerships and true co-authorship. Uh, this is something that a lot of curators and scholars are thinking about today on real sustained collaborative partnerships, real co-authorship. Um, and this is something that's difficult to get at in a permanent gallery installation. So that's something we can talk about. Um, but this is something that I also aim to do more and more in my work. So as I've argued, curation is no longer pushing a singular voice or narrative, but is a fundamentally relational and collaborative effort. Lately, I think of myself as a facilitator, very different from how I was trained, for sure, um, and acting as a conduit to bring together different perspectives than as an all-knowing curator spinning a singular story or able to have I can tell what cultural group made this particular art. Like That's an old model of uh, museum training at least for African arts. I couldn't possibly tell all the stories that there are to tell, 
but I can help funnel in different ones from source communities and act as a bridge between different communities and modes of understanding, and also mentor in another more diverse generation of curators, which is also an important movement right now. And my training means that I understand the complex web of the museum apparatus, which definitely needs training. So for example, Senegal's most famous fashion designer, Umu Si, collaborated with me to create the gold ensemble on the right from the Harn Museum and the Peace, Power and Prestige exhibition, which is on view right now at the Ackland Art Museum. So I encourage you to go and visit it. So C and I met on several occasions in her studio in Dakar, where we together decided that this historic basket of flowers motif was the most important and long-standing design in women's gold jewelry in Senegal. Other examples have emerged in my work with Good as Gold, Fashioning Senegalese Women, which is where I first collaborated with Madame C, and several notable fashion designers were added to the NCMA version of the exhibition. For it, each designer fashioned her own ensemble, creating and articulating how she saw gold jewelry and women's histories as important to their daily lives and historically speaking as well. Each dictated how they wanted their ensembles to be installed over the course of many conversations. I'm still working with these women to publish a peer reviewed journal article on decolonizing fashion. So this has become a partnership that I hope is sustained and sustainable. And now I'm working with the Museum of Black Civilization and the Ifan Museum in Dakar for that upcoming masquerade project that I just mentioned. So I'm working with people I met on multiple trips in Dakar and in preparation for Good as Gold. So again, the partnerships grow, they evolve, you, you kind of germinate them and then hopefully they, they keep on um, strengthening one another. So this is that building up of trust and respect that I mentioned earlier as part of radical listening and towards what I hope is healing. So you have to kind of show up and open yourself up to new possibilities and ways of doing. And I hope to do, I wanna get better and better at it. It's something I'm thinking through more. Um, so let's return to the definition of a curator that we began with and think about it in relation to this one. It's less the current working definition. You'll remember from earlier the, that question, uh, that, that curation is tied to the selection and care of objects. But as you see here in its etymological history, its original version is directly tied to notions of curing, healing, and taking care or giving attention to people. This lasted until the late 18th century when Euro-Americans, I argue, especially collected and sought to civilize and control the world through various forms of ownership. So if colonial collections are contaminated, as argued by Savoy and Saar in 2017, Peter Probst in 2020, in the Benin Kingdom objects, does the museum itself need to heal? This is an open-ended question. Are we, or can we get back to this original definition of curation? And is this our transitional moment for that? Rather than caring for, conserving, keeping, preserving objects and serving as the expert in our field, for our collections, curators are now charged with the well being of people and emotions. By contending with and representing intangible heritage and issues of ownership, we attend to these things through radical listening and decolonial practice, attending to issues of ethics, morality, and by critically analyzing colonial emergence of museums and collecting, decolonizing knowledge, and repositioning expertise, which has its own problems that we can discuss in the QA. So museums and curators are now tasked with bridging and challenging the original expectations and old models of museums. So objects as beautiful, representative nationhood, defining art, uh, curator as connoisseur, et cetera, with heritage and experience and the mental and emotional health of those we seek to represent. Curators have major ethical responsibilities now too, acting as entrepreneurs, activists, artists, and facilitators, and curatorship becomes more cross-cultural, reciprocal, symmetrical, evocative, and hopefully more meaningful. I do want to note that recon reconciling politics of identity, race, conflict, and change has been a preoccupation of museums and curators since the 1980s. So what I'm doing is not necessarily new. And the collaborative approach dates back to the 2000s and is especially strong in Canadian and Indigenous American uh, partnerships and collaborations, also New Zealand, Maori, 
Um, it has been general practice to have community consultations in the US, but it rarely goes beyond consultancy or community panels after the curatorial strategy is in place. So that's something different that we're doing with New Mass now, for example, trying to do those partnerships from the planning phase. Uh, so similarly, artists have been invited to intervene in museums for decades, most prominently or memorably in Fred Wilson's 1992 Mining the Museum. So there's a precedent for cross-cultural dialogue, which invariably entails curatorial work being viewed and conducted as a social process, with its acknowledgement of people's relationships to objects. So again, we come back to relationships to objects and the emotional and intangible connections that are part and parcel of these objects' lives, yet often unattended to. So however, curatorial preoccupations with co-authorship uh has reached a new a fever pitch now it's it's definitely a much bigger thing this is exacerbated by anxiety politics that i've mentioned globalization the age of social media and the internet and it's accompanied by a devaluation of curatorial expertise and knowledge and a reductivist view of scholarship so there are drawbacks obviously and benefits to these cataclysmic changes in short curatorial and museum authority was challenged before and it is again now but much more expediently than in the past. The digital age does offer compelling opportunities for creative reparations, restitutions, and provenance research. And heritage comes in many new forms. Um, think also new digital heritage, which is also taking shape and we can discuss. So we looked at several things today, provenance and collections histories, reparations and restitutions, curatorial practice as creating space hopefully for radical change, intangible heritage, collaboration and co-authorship. So I'd like to end with the work of two artists, Mwangechi Mutu and performance artist uh, Grace Nduritu, who uses shamanism, practices of sharing, group meditations, as well as ideas of healing and reconciliation and joint land ownership to challenge and heal the museum. As she shows us, we can use spaces differently, less statically, to allow for more bodies and voices to emerge and amplify these experiences through gratitude and dedication. In finding alternative ways to create and different ways of seeing, we can break down established boundaries and dualisms. She also shows us that museums as performative spaces and curation as a thinking through can contribute to peace building in an era of global conflict. As Mongechi Mutu has also reminds us, arts and artists can help bring us together and heal, but equally shine a light on the problems of the past and how they influence our present. Value, affirmation, inspiration, and community become increasingly important, as does our humanity, the need to find common ground and to feel connected. At such times as we find ourselves in, we look to our past as we strive to revise and retell it and to define our now innumerable futures. So I'm going to stop there. I went a little bit over more than I wanted, but um, there are many, many other things that I didn't even get a chance to mention, but I hope kind of come out in the conversation. Um, so we still have at least 15 minutes, right? Yeah. <laughs> So yeah, those are a lot of things that are only recently coming to mind in, in the work. And I think you can probably tell it really is a thinking through right now and it's an evolving incremental um, project and change to, to alter such a slow moving vehicle as a museum. <laughs> Great, well, thank you so much, Amanda. Um, can you all join me in thanking Dr. Maples? That was a wonderful presentation. You can use um, digital or physical applause as you wish. <laughs> um, so thank you so much. That was great. Um, I have questions, but I'm going to save my questions because I bet there are lots of questions and um, reactions from the 46 of you who are in attendance. So um, um, I'll just look for hands that are raised or you can. Aisha. Oh, Sorry. Alexis. Um, I saw Aisha raised her yeah. hand. Yeah. And then thanks, Alexis. <laughs> Um, Aisha, did you have your hand up? No, sorry. I just wanted to say good job. That was my hand. <laughs> Thank okay. You. Okay. It's nice to hear your voice. <laughs> <laughs> you too. Um, so, does anyone have a question initially? Yes. May, may I um, 
this is Alexis Roan. Hey, beautiful one. Um, I was taking notes. I was wondering if the presentation would be available, but specifically I wanted to talk, uh, have you uh, address more of the, the uh, I think you called it curatorial uh, creating spaces. Does that mean uh, a collaborative curation or um, you leading the effort to, um, to, to create or, or, or to, to find the, um, just the creative placemaking, I guess, in, in, in museum spaces? Yeah, um, let me think how I can answer that. So for me, creating space and, and elevating other voices and experiences needs to go beyond a quote on the wall. I think that's where for me, I'm kind of, I'm running into a roadblock where we need to do more. And so in terms of co-authorship, it's bringing in other voices and other knowledge systems that are outside of the Western Ivory Tower or trained curatorial scholarship or whatnot, and bringing them into a conversation that can kind of twist the, the kind of status quo, the normative models of thinking about Western experience or history or any of those things. So for example, with the New Mass Now project, um, we're hoping to bring, well, we're working directly with all of the artists to create and commission masks for the exhibition. So everything we're doing from start to finish is completely transparent, completely open and driven by the artists and the communities we're working with. And then we're hoping to partner, um, we have a, a meeting next month with Ifan and the Museum of Black Civilization in Dakar so that they can, they can partner, they want to partner with us so that they are part of the planning process. So the needs and expectations of an African museum are met within the same framework and foundations of a Western museum. Because that's a very different, like Good as Gold was supposed to travel there too, but then the pandemic happened and they had significant changes to the rhetoric of that show. Um, and I thought that was really interesting too, to talk to curators in Dakar about how that show needed to be um, presented in a very different way. So if you start from the very beginning of writing these things together, you're gonna have a different model, a different um, kind of exhibition to work with. And yeah, I was thinking of you, Alexis. Alexis came to visit Good as Gold um, and some of the photographs by Alun B and was really um, empowered by them and said something that has been sticking with me, which is, uh, don't play small. Uh, and these women said that to her, don't play small, play big, you know, get out there. And I think for me, I'm in the middle of an experimental kind of change in my job. And I think that's what I'm sort of talking about is I was trained very differently um, to sort of spin out these short hundred word texts on, you know, very basic, you know, art historical scholarship. And I think we have to do it differently. So we're in the middle of this right now. And, and that's why I don't have any answers right now and just sort of like here's the things I'm thinking about here's what I'm trying to do but within the challenge of a, a large institution that might have other needs and other people uh, other staff boards uh, uh, you know funding shortages things like that so uh, I don't know if I answered all of it Alexis but hopefully um yes thank thank you for that answer I mean I appreciate it sure and um, uh, I'm, well, I just will, I'll plug this really quickly. There's a global assembly that we're trying to do in October um, that's also overturning those, you know, lecture-based models of um, how you interpret art or how you experience a space. So Alexis will be part of that. I hope we're going to apply for some funding. Um, but it's a 24-hour spread where people come together in spaces all over the world to decolonize and to think about healing and to think about, um, it's also fashioning the body. So there's some really interesting um, elements of that. And we're going to do some henna and drink some tea, some repentance tea by Chef Kabui. <laughs> so we have some really interesting things planned. This will probably be a cam, but it'll be a partnership between obviously see very many people in the community. Um, and yeah, I just think it's a much cooler, more embodied way to, to think through what we're all experiencing and how arts can change our lives and not just sitting them on a wall with a label text. Like it has to go further now. That's where we're at. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I just wanted to plug that global assembly. Keep your eye out for it. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Um, yeah, I think you're really getting at the heart of it when you say embodied too, just to mention that maybe that's a thread that runs through a lot of what you've presented today. Um, there's a question in the chat from Reginald and Celeste Hodges, oh. <laughs> uh, who ask if traditional works were gifted to individuals who then gifted them to museums, should the individuals or museums feel guilty for removing the art from its original setting, presumably in Africa? 
This is, I, I love that question. Hello, Reggie and Celeste. They have been huge supporters of the arts and education in the whole area. We, we love them, thank you. Um, and they lived in Sierra Leone and other African countries for a long time, collected amazing things that were gifted to them. Um, I believe in one instance, uh, a Sunday mask because of a school that Reggie helped build, right? And that provenance information is actually the kind of value that we're looking for and feeding off of and, and highlighting. That's the value that I'm sort of, I was getting to in that presentation. There's just a difference in value now. Um, it wasn't bought through some fancy gallery in France. You know, it, it came through um, an embodied exchange of real life connections. And, and so our responsibility is to bring things like that into the collection. So I'm glad that you asked because no, you shouldn't feel guilty. They think the individuals giving things to people is a really important narrative. Um, and also with this extreme focus on restitution right now, I think people assume that all arts over a certain period of time have been unethically collected or were taken um, under duress. And that is absolutely not the case. Certainly it is in a lot of instances. And that's why we have to highlight those histories. But at the same time, say, they also came in through diplomatic gifts, through commissioning, through, um, you know, someone built a school and it was given as a gift. It was even Benin Kingdom things that were given as diplomatic gifts. So we have to really um, pry open those expectations and those sort of bounds of what we think about in collecting practices. Uh, so I think I, I Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, <laughs> not yeah. at all. But I think, you know, it's another really quick, cool thing to highlight with Reggie and Celeste is that they, from the beginning, said that they would love to see if these um, arts returned to Sierra Leone. And so we could think about, with that support, which is amazing, sending um, a selection of objects to the Sierra Leone National Museum for display there for a time and then back again. Like, it would be an amazing uh, conversation and, and partnership. Yeah. So, yeah, no, I, I don't think so at all. <laughs> no guilt. <laughs> I mean, it, it also gets at something that I'm always telling my students, including those who are here, uh, which is specificity is everything, right? The story, the, the specific narrative of a specific object, which African art, as you pointed out, too rarely gets. So I think your answer really gets at that. Um, other questions? Taylor. Hi, Amanda, that was so good. <laughs> um, I, I'm interested though, if you've given any thought to, cause you've, uh, you've highlighted all the different ways that you were thinking about collaboration on the preparatory side for mm -hmm. installations. And then I'm, I'm wondering if you've given thought to how you are um, kind of um, viewing or collecting um, receptions and perceptions of these experiences from the opposite side. So from people who are engaging with your curated exhibit, let's say, you know? Yeah, actually, I think I think I know what you're asking. Um, we just hired a full-time staff member who is our museum evaluator. So their whole job is to put things out there and ask people's feedback. Um, and you know, if I wanted to know how are people responding to this particular artwork, are they clicking on the QR codes or anything that I've put out there? Um, she can do that. So, uh, and we're also doing polls. We did a lot of feedback on that um, interchanges thing I talked about, the, the cross-cultural conversations, 90% more uh, loved that. And I think that was a huge, um, it was a good amount of feedback for us to continue on with the way that we're doing the reinstallation. So absolutely, yes, we have to have these evaluations. Um, I think what we're missing with those, at least as far as I, I know, because it's not my job, that is people that are already coming into the museum. So how are we capturing those that do not feel welcome in the museum right now? And so that's something I think about constantly is how can I draw other people in that would feel more comfortable sharing their experience or even just showing up and being there? Um, another thing I'm doing is we'll have that QR code and as part of my QR code, if people scan it, so that's the other challenge, <laughs> um, is having a smartphone, getting, you know, scanning it, uh, is a little feedback place. So you can actually respond to, I either want to do a specific question that changes that people can write in, 
Or, yeah, I think I'm going to do a specific question, like, what does African art mean to you? Not that broad, but like, <laughs> what is, you know, how is Africa populate in your worldview? Or what do you think after visiting or just something like that? Um, so that comes directly to me and or will be shared out with other people. So we have conversations. Again, this is all in the works right now. It has to be in conversation with other staff members. I can't just do whatever I want. Uh, <laughs> so I can propose my ideas and then they'll kind of massage them with me and create that kind of experience. But yeah, feedback is super important to me. Otherwise, who am I talking to? Like, know your audience and, and know that they matter and try to work with people on that level. So thanks for that question. I hope I answered it all, all the, the way. <laughs> um, other questions? From anyone? I mean, I'll just add, and I know we only have a couple minutes left, that um, this is very exciting just to think about the way that African art, and I do think it's particular to African art, not just Dr. Maples, but other curators as well, is really in the lead, I think, in reshaping you know, the way that museums relate to their publics. And the only next step that we need is, as you pointed out, you're not trained to do this work that you're doing. You're trained to do one part of it. So I think it's really exciting to think about all the people whose talents might uh, find a home in museums in new ways that perhaps didn't in the past. So I think that there's a big picture. It's already a big picture at the NCMA, but the picture is even bigger than that and really exciting. Yeah, thanks for pointing that out. It is a particular kind of training that, yeah, I. I didn't know how to capacity build. I don't know how to capacity build, but I'm learning it. I have mm -hmm. to. Um, I, and I'm learning how to reach out to the community. And it takes being brave and experimental and being okay with failing or, or getting, you know, feedback that says kind of you're, you're not doing it the best way. So just, mm -hmm. you know, it's it's a process. It's a thinking through <laughs> and yeah. a willingness to, to, have, to be called out. And I mean, there's all sorts of other issues um, with the hiring of curators in the country right now too, and that's specific to the field of African arts that are like a sort of skirted around that, that are, you know, mm -hmm. we're changing the kind of people that we hire and the experience that they have. And I think that if we all do work together, we can make a larger change in this country for how African arts are interpreted. Right. Um, and, and, then, and then all arts mm -hmm. and yeah. then all culture, so. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, so um, I guess we're out of time, even though I hate to say that. If um, if anyone has any other questions, I know that Dr. Maples would be open. I'm going to just leap in and say that to hearing from you. And I just want to thank you again, Amanda. That was wonderful. A wonderful presentation. So thank you. And thank you all for coming. Thanks for listening to me as I think through all these things. <laughs>